Haven't done one of these little ditties in a long time. It should be fun. Let's have some speculation based off of nothing other than a simple little picture that we've got nothing to really go off of. So in this little bid ditty, we have it in this third chapter of Warhammer, Jason plays the voice of Prince Aravael, the bearer of the powerful amulet of Sunfire. This was found and put onto the uh, forums. Uh, Jason, what's his name? Jason Anthony is the guy who voices Techless, and he put this on his, uh, I guess, resume, as it were. Um, but this gives us a little bit of information. The voice of Prince Aravael, so an actual voice, Char voiced character and the bearer of the powerful amulet of sunfire now prince aravael is dead in the current place of the lore and we're going to go through all this right here but i think that this kind of leads us into a door for a possible inclusion of another high elf legendary lord in aislin aislin is a character that i think would bring about some very fun aquatic Type things as well the Lothern, the Lothern sky cutters the ability to have these flying ships brought to the high elf army the last things that we actually don't have um in the high elf roster right like we those those Lothern sky cutters are missing and the, the high elf character himself Aislinn is a sea lord and the sea lords um play a pretty pivotal role too as far as the relationship between the high elves the dark elves their mastery of the sea and the the former name for the high elves of any any high elf that was uh going about the ocean exploring trading was typically called a sea elf uh there wasn't a specific race or anything like that but um these characters the 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 uh what's it called the sea lords or the current sea lord aislin um there is still a character for the High Elves that is not represented as a hero, and we would get that probably with Aislinn as well. But let's go into Prince Aravael and how this could possibly come into this whole thing together and the Eastern Colony. So we're talking about Prince Aravael. We're talking about the powerful amulet of Sunfire. And we're going to have to go here into Morvael, one of the uh, um, Phoenix Kings of old. Now, this Imperial calendar is 1121 to 1503, just to kind of give you a, a sense of... Uh, presence of where this character is and I, I have done a whole two part video on all of the phoenix kings if you want to watch that i'll link it in the upper right corner but basically this kind of goes into uh his whole ruling and how he kind of went about and how he died and so on and so forth um but we get this important little bit the blessings of lilith during the golden age the goddess lilith presented three gifts to the elves the first was the star crown said to have granted the bear visions of all times and places known to the gods the second was the amulet of sunfire which brought hope to those in despair but whose fury no evil creature could abide now the last gift was the moon sap blah, blah 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 now the last part here this last paragraph is important the Amulet of Sunfire was lost forever during Morvael's reign. Against the Council of Hoeth's lore masters, the Phoenix King gifted it to his son, Aravael, as the prince took ship, took ship for a distant land. Alas, Prince Aravael never reached his destination, but was spirited to a watery grave in the depths of the churning gulf. The Amulet of Sunfire has never been seen since. So, methinks that Prince Aravael will play a role in a possible quest line for Aislinn, um, either as like part of his story or whatever. Maybe maybe Aislinn has access to something akin to the Vampire Coast Sea Shanties, if they were to add that character. And this allows you to kind of have some sort of scrounging of these artifacts that are lost throughout the many um, seas and oceans and gulfs of the Warhammer world. Because if we take a look at the Churning Gulf, where does that put us? Boom! Right here by the Fortress of Dawn. Now, in the Immortal Empire starting location, Location, we know that that is exactly where uh, Kairos Fate Weaver starts, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything as far as how this could affect an Aislinn quest line or storyline for his campaign. Let's look over here to the actual uh, Mortal Empires map. We can see Dawn's Landing in the Churning Gulf, all places on the Immortal Empires map. The thing is, though, with any DLC for the game, it would have to include. It had to be included into the uh, Realm of Chaos campaign, right? Because that's how it worked with Warhammer 2. It had to be included in, its ba in the Vortex Realm or the Vortex campaign. So that'd be a very interesting campaign for the Sea Lord to be pretty much in like what what is effectively this region of the map where there's very little sea play. So I wonder if they were to bring Aislinn, and it is in fact Aislinn, um, and not some other high elf character. And again, we're going off a harebrained thing. This could just be... Um, 
They might have changed the existing Legendary Lords quest lines and just made it so that Prince Arvael has a presence in it, and it's just part of that. This is, again, guys, like I said, totally baseless. I'm just kind of taking a little bit of information and extrapolating maybe far too much uh, because I can. But still, um, you get the Sea of Dread as a little bit of more of a playing area in the in the in the chaos campaign, but for the most part, I don't really know how they would integrate this unless they did a series of DLCs that are just like, hey, this is Immortal Empires only. Don't don't buy this if you don't have it, which I think is kind of spicy, but we'll, kind of interesting how they would might play that out. But again, the Churning Gulf is right here, Dawn's Landing, um, and this brings us into the Eastern Colonies, which is a set a subset kind of of the uh, the high elf realm so here we have a pretty good map that gives us an idea we have the citadel of dusk the fortress of dawn tor lessor tower of the sun gates of Kalith, and tor elethys these are all and tower of stars these are all pretty much the eastern colonies and they make up a well these are not eastern colonies but these all are and they make up a pretty important portion of the lore tower of the sun right over here the Alabaster Fortress watches over sea routes across the southern ocean and acts as a staging post should the armies of Ulthuan need passage to the lands of Ind, Cathay, and beyond. It is be always depicted in a silhouette like this. So you get the Tower of Sun as a possible portion of a, a, a potential objective for the uh, for an Aislinn kind of campaign, right? Even when we look at the Citadel of Dusk and Fortress of Dawn, which are Things that we've already kind of played around with, you can kind of see these guys here. The spires of this port city are built around a single colossal waystone, a rare and valuable remnant of days when the sun never set upon the Phoenix King's empire. The Citadel of Dusk is invisible to all save those who serve within its walls. It stands guard over the sea routes to the Turtle Isles and beyond. The fortress garrisons bear banners the color of the night sky. So just kind of a, a pretty important thing. Now, Another little bit that could fall into this is an antagonist, and an antagonist with Lokir Felhart, and a, a, a kind of the antithesis to um, Aislinn, and, and they they have a very kind of intimate relationship here, right here. So the fall of Tor Elasor, uh, Elasor, whatever you want to call it, pronounce it, at the Witch King's command, Lokir Felhart led a great fleet of vessels against the far-flung High Elf colony of Tor Elasor. At dawn, Black Ark's towers of blessed dread and immortal agony breached the shoreward walls with a barrage of sorcerer's shot, allowing corsairs to ransack the city beyond. Though the High Elves within fought valiantly, they could not match their attacker's ferocity. By the time the dusk fell, Tor Elasor was a blood-wreathed ruin. Felhart nailed his still breathing warden, or its still breathing warden, Prince Detherian, to the uppermost wall of the central keep. So swift had the attack been that no word escaped to reach Ulthuan when Sea Lord Aislinn led a fleet to discover the cause of Torlasor's silence. He found the colony a charnel place of rotting flesh and rampant decay. There's more to that story, though. So let's jump over here to the actual um, kind of big portion of the dark elves campaign not uh, lore book we kind of find out that the 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 relationship between these two characters is that lokir felhart almost kills aislin and then we have the eclipse wars here every 10th year the court of the ever queen goes forth upon a seaborne pilgrimage to the hidden tower of the sun south of the equator the queen alone can hold back the slow encroachment of the gravid orb morris Lieb that occurs with every eclipse with her goes the royal fleet of Ulthuan, carrying an immense host of her finest troops, a score of moon dragons flying alongside. The royal war host fights its way through the bizarre denizens of the land of a thousand gods, battling against tribes of tiger-headed warriors, prides of winged lions, and troops of six-armed monkey warriors who resent the elves' intrusion into their domain. Upon reaching the tower, the Ever Queen gives up her own moonblood in a great ritual that ensures Morsleep is held at bay for another decade. Such as the elven way to save the world and expect nothing in return. That's so fucking haughty, those high elves, right? Uh, but again, that could be part of this. The Eclipse Wars could be part of an Aislinn mechanic where you have to get these certain things or maybe pave the way for the Ever Queen's um, uh, voyage down into this, right? The royal fleet of Ulthuan. And you're trying to let an NPC faction, kind of in the same way that you take a look at with... Uh, um, the Hag Queen. What's her name? Whatever. The Hag Queen and how she has like the blood party that goes and tries to attack Alariel, right? On its own as an NPC faction. It'd be interesting if you have to guide this NPC Royal Fleet faction as a kind of wild escort quest down into 
the Tower of the Sun as a part of an Aislinn uh, campaign objective. I just think that there could be so many different fun ways you could deal with this. You have the Gates of Caliph, which kind of act as that that entryway into the very bottom of Koresh into the, the uh, uh, Nippon area. And we have a big, huge bit of interaction between that, even with the Skaven as well. So Skaven have an interaction with with the uh, Caliph. You have all this presence of, of Aislinn being all up in this piece. So I think that, again, this is really a super harebrained thing, guys. I'm just kind of like looking at a sentence and going, this could be so much. So I apologize if you wanted to get something really cool out of this video of like concrete information. I'm just taking a look at this and saying, hey, we could get some really cool speculation going off of that because I've always wanted to see Sea Lord Aislinn added to the game. I've wanted to see some of the characters he could possibly bring. Um, we kind of get one of his characters in the new High Elf Rangers that were added, um, which are very similar to a sword and board style of unit that he would have brought as part of a, um, an allied contingent um, from one of the White Dwarfs or something like that. Um, also, getting like access to say not necessarily myrrh worms a lot of people want to see him having like access to these which he had kind of a, like a loose control of in the end times um but again lothern, lothern sky cutters is the big thing get those flying presences brought into the uh, high elf roster in one of the only ways possible i think when you kind of look at the character that would probably be um leading it so i think it's the the sea helm there's the hero character. I just can't remember the name of him off the top of my head. But as always, guys, just wanted to have a little bit of fun here with some Warhammer 3 speculation and Prince Aislinn. Go ahead and let me know in the comment section below. Do you think this is a hairbrain idea? Do you think this is a good idea? Do you want to see him in a different way? Do you think this is not even having to do with the High Elves and it maybe has to do with an entirely different thing regarding just the Amulet of Sunfire itself and being a different objective for a different faction? Always love to hear what you guys are thinking in the comment section below. But as always, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.